let's move on to our next session. As we all know, COVID-19 has far-reaching effects across the world and across industries and, of course, beyond healthcare. Our next speaker, Shankar Chandran, is going to discuss investment trends and themes in the COVID-19 era. Shankar is a Senior Vice President, Managing Director, and Head of Samsung Catalyst Fund, Samsung's electronics evergreen multi-stage venture capital fund that invests in the new data economy and strategic ideas for Samsung's mobile device solutions, consumer electronics groups, with offices in Menlo Park, New York, Paris, Berlin, and Tel Aviv. Shankar has been an active venture investor for the past 18 years. He's joined Samsung in early 2013. Before that, Shankar was a partner at Panorama Capital and JP Morgan Partners. He's held various engineering, business development, and management roles at Applied Materials and has been granted eight patents as the primary inventor. Shankar, thank you so much for joining us today. Please take it away. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Atul, and thank you, Francis, and also the Cisco team. Uh, tough act to follow today, but I'm Really delighted, really delighted to join you all today. Uh, it's an honor to talk to the top 50 or so founders and their teams uh, out of XTC. XTC, I think this year had uh, 2,500 uh, companies apply. You're the top 2%, so that's fantastic. Uh, really honored to talk to you today. As you all know, Samsung has been a sponsor, an anchor sponsor of Extreme Tech Challenge. Uh, this is something that we have taken uh, uh, taken on with a with a lot of passion, and we really want to see this uh, to be one of the world's best startup competitions, and to have the first group of 50 or so uh, startups join us today, uh, and to be able to talk to them uh, is really a pleasure. Uh, I just want to say a few words before I jump into my presentation. Uh, I think one of the key things to think about, but particularly after uh, what Francis and Atul just talked about, we do live in extraordinary times today, uh, but we are also uh, living in a time of great hope. Uh, and I want to be able to give you a little bit of sense of where is the world going, uh, how does it really impact the venture capital industry, because venture capital, as you all know, is the lifeblood of the, of the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. It really helps to, uh, to accelerate uh, what you guys are doing and what you're passionate about. Uh, and also give you a, perhaps a little bit of sense of what my team, our team at Samsung has been thinking about. How do we really change our business uh, to orient ourselves towards where the world is going? Uh, so uh, I know uh, all of you are presenting to an elite panel of uh, venture capitalists next week. Uh, to win the competition and 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 perhaps uh, beyond that you're also going to be talking to several of the folks uh, to raise capital for your own uh, for your own companies uh, hopefully uh, my talk today gives you a little bit of insight on what investors are thinking about today of course feel free to give your questions in uh, and and Barrett I'll try to do this in about 15 minutes or so so yeah there's plenty of time for questions uh, let me try to share my screen here let me first uh, orient you all to uh, to Samsung Electronics, the company I work for. Uh, and uh, this is a company that has grown to be one of the world's largest technology companies by revenue. Uh, we're roughly about $200 billion. We're a global company. Uh, the one thing I want to talk about the company's culture is this core ethos we have of co-prosperity. Uh, it really talks to uh, how we work with you as entrepreneurs and founders of startups. Uh, we believe fundamentally that your success uh, is, is what matters, and that's really going to be helpful to, uh, for us to be successful. Uh, it's a core value of the company, and that's one of the core reasons why uh, we exist inside of Samsung as a venture capital team investing in uh, founders and CEOs like yourself. Uh, Samsung, uh, over the years, we've been venture capitalists for Samsung as a team uh, for many, many years. Uh, we are one of the top three uh, venture capital teams in the world. If you take a look at the amount of uh, investments we do, the number of investments we do, we roughly do about 70 investments a year uh, into startups globally. Uh, we're also, if you take a look at the amount of uh, dollars we put to work, uh, it is also uh, among the top three venture capitalists, corporate venture capitalists, and we're very proud of that to be great supporters of the ecosystem. Uh, my team, uh, uh, the team that Francis Ho and I run, 
uh, is Samson Catalyst Fund. Uh, we are a $500 million evergreen fund. Uh, we worked for Young Son, who was Chief Strategy Officer and President at Samsung Electronics. Now, Young Son also happens to be the founder of Extreme Tech Challenge and has been a core inspiration for all of us to think about how we uh, take XTC and, and make it a, a, a huge impact uh, in the way people live and to help world, uh, make the world a better place. So thank you again for... Uh, for joining us uh, in, in making this a grand success. Let me start by channeling Young's uh, words here a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about five C's, and I think uh, many of you may have five C's uh, uh, of, of your own. Uh, you know, if you're a marketing person, you probably think about the five C's. If you've ever <laughs> had to buy a, a ring for your fiance, you probably thought about the five C's uh, in a diamond. Uh, for Samsung, we really think about uh, the five C's that make a macro impact in the world that we live in today. And the biggest C of all clearly is the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus that we are, in, uh, we are in right now, the global pandemic that we are all experiencing. And it has an impact on every one of the other C's. And I'd like to point that out to you uh, because as you think about uh, how you're going to build your company and how you're going to be uh, uh, leveraging uh, the crisis that we are in today, uh, you have to think about the five C's. Uh, I think uh, beyond COVID-19, I think what has really been driving uh, the engine for uh, growth, uh, even in these times of pandemic, has been consumer behavior. Uh, clearly, uh, consumers have dramatically changed their behavior. In fact, we've all been changing our behavior over the last uh, decade or so in pretty dramatic ways. It's only changed more, and Atul and Francis talked about how consumers have changed the way they consume healthcare. I think it's true that consumers have changed their way in many different ways, and I think it's one of the topics we'll talk about more today. Now, the reason why consumers have been able to change their behavior so quickly is because of the ubiquitous cloud. Uh, the cloud, brings the world together. The world is ever flatter today. The fact that we're having a call today uh, with folks from all over the world is because of the cloud infrastructure that's being put out. And I'll quote Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft here. Uh, he recently said that they've had to put in infrastructure into their cloud uh, uh, in two months, what they'd originally planned to do in over two years. That's the dramatic increase in capacity that they've had to do inside of their Azure cloud in order to meet the demand of, of, of communication uh, as well as other um, software and other infrastructure that co consumers all over the world and enterprises all over the world are consuming today. So that gives you a sense of how elastic this capability is to be able to do what you plan to do in two years in just two months. You have to be fundamentally elastic. And that really is what has enabled uh, all the services that we're consuming today. Now, cybersecurity is extremely important. Uh, I think uh, what has happened is with uh, folks uh, like myself and all of you working from home, uh, the edge of the enterprise is now your home. Uh, but the home does not have anywhere close to the level of firewalls and all the cybersecurity software that you typically have uh, inside your firewall uh, in, a, in an enterprise. And now, with, with home being the edge of the enterprise, uh, we've had to really think about how uh, we completely reinvent uh, the way uh, we can do things at home so that uh, we are much, much better off uh, in, 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 in protecting ourselves, uh, in making sure that um, it, we, uh, we as consumers uh, not only protect our assets, our, our ability to uh, make sure that you know, we don't get hacked, our data, uh, et cetera. So now, uh, uh, one other thing to think about, uh, we live in uh, quite uncertain times when it comes to geopolitics. Uh, now, I've, uh, we've, we've said China here, but really I think uh, what it really has to think about is geopolitics because what is happening uh, around the world is uh, some startups or some companies have had to choose between uh, United States and China. Uh, in terms of the markets they want to be in because the regulations are different. There's also a trade war going on. Uh, so I think as a startup, especially a global startup, uh, you have to think about 
what that means to your business. How does geopolitics really impact your business? So think about these five things as much as you're in the trenches, uh, you know, trying to win customers. I think you, are, you live in a macro environment where these five C's really do matter. So, uh, so I'd like to make sure that you guys uh, have a chance to think through this. Uh, now, uh, a little bit about the data that uh, Atul and Francis talked about, and there's a sobering chart uh, that gives you a sense of uh, what is happening around the world. And clearly, wherever you are today, in some, some, some place, you may be better off than the other. Uh, but I think regardless of where you are, uh, you will all agree with me that uh, the way you uh, the way you've thought about your business, the way you thought about your personal life, your families, uh, has fundamentally changed. And I think to think about uh, how the world is changing today uh, is really important. And I think uh, uh, that's one of the topics that I'd like to talk about more today. Uh, how have the consumers changed? Uh, if you take just take a look at the U.S. consumer data. Uh, what is clear is that uh, right when the pandemic happened and the lockdowns went into effect and the shelters in place went into effect, uh, if you take a look at retail, if you take a look at uh, what consumers were doing in gross, grocery stores or, or office supplies, there was a little bit of a spike uh, that eventually kind of uh, went away. Uh, and I think uh, that that's clearly understandable. People were hoarding a little bit in the early days, uh, but then it's somewhat normalized. People still need groceries, you know, uh, people still need the office supplies uh, that we are doing, but uh, we're clearly not traveling as much. I used to travel uh, once a month or every other month. I have not traveled uh, since uh, since February this year, uh, and that's really rare. And I think a lot of people around the world are not traveling that much anymore. I have not uh, stayed in a hotel anywhere, and I think most people uh, are not doing it unless they really have to. Uh, so I think clearly and, and people and i haven't been to the theater or or the movies either so people are clearly not doing certain things and how long will it take for these to come back it's really hard to know but what is also clear is people have shifted those dollars that they had planned to use for travel or hotel expenses or other areas and they've moved those dollars over to other uh, parts and i think that's worth thinking about now the bottom right chart uh, the pharmacy uh, that's a really interesting one and somewhat troubling uh, if you think about it. Uh, the trend there, uh, as much as there was a little bit of a spike at the beginning of the crisis, shows that there's been a reduced spend. And, uh, and I'm sure Atul and Francis uh, know more, more about this, but I worry that the, the trend of negative spend in pharmacy uh, may be prescriptions that are not being filled. And that really means that you know, so people, particularly with chronic illnesses, uh, likely are not treating themselves the way they should be. And that leads to further problems down the road. And I hope that uh, that's not the case, uh, but I suspect that to be the case. And, and we should really watch that uh, as things progress. A little bit more about consumers. Uh, I mentioned earlier on, the home really has become the edge of the enterprise, but it's not just that. The home has become uh, the school, the university. My kids uh, have been uh, going to school from home. Uh, uh, using Zoom connections like this one. Uh, I've had to upgrade the internet in my home. I've had to upgrade the routers and, and the number of connected devices. Uh, I've had to install more security at home. Uh, I've, I've also had to do uh, telemedicine from home for the family, right? So everything's fundamentally changed in the way uh, we're dealing with things. And it's just not just me, but everybody around the world are really using their home as the point of... Uh, uh, of e of, of retail, we, we, we do we consume uh, the, the things that we want to buy uh, through e-commerce mostly, and that's done through a portal at home. So I think what has happened at, uh, fundamentally is we've shifted dollars away from travel and, and hotels and, and theater and all the things that we're used to doing as communities physically outside onto digital ways of consuming, uh, consuming many of the same things and doing it from home. And what that's done is fundamental explosion in the infrastructure that's had to be put deployed, uh, not only in, in Microsoft and Amazon and some of the cloud service providers, but in your home. And I think that's been a fundamental change and a step function uh, in the last few months. Now, what that's done uh, as a ripple effect 
as trillion dollar industries are transforming themselves. You know, healthcare uh, is a is a eight trillion dollar industry, and that's fundamentally changing itself. Uh, automotive uh, is fundamentally changing itself in terms because the number of cars that are getting purchased is extremely slow today. Uh, as well as uh, people aren't doing that many ride shares, right? That's an industry going through transformation. So is education. Uh, so is banking. So I think these multi-trillion dollar industries are getting transformed right in front of us. And let's take a look at uh, some examples here. Uh, you know, we talked about cloud and how cloud uh, infrastructure is being deployed. Uh, we also talked about healthcare, where Atul and Francis referred to many things there. Uh, what's interesting is take a look at banking infrastructure, for example. What is uh, what is incredible here is uh, contactless uh, uh, payments has has really gone through the roof. You know, people are beginning to more and more trust uh, the internet and to be able to use their mobile devices uh, for uh, banking services. May people. Uh, don't have to go into a physical bank uh, to do uh, transactions anymore. And sure, we've had this capability for, for a while, but what COVID-19 has forced uh, people to do is even those who are used to doing things physically, they've really moved things over to a digital environment. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Uh, the same thing can be thought of as uh, in, in services like Instacart, uh, where many, many people here in San Francisco where I live uh, have started using Instacart for the first time uh, to be able to deliver uh, groceries uh, to their doorstep. Uh, so I think what is interesting is that uh, several sectors are transforming fundamentally, and many of these sectors will not go back to what they used to be before. And it's the same thing that Atul talked about in healthcare. So I think it's important to think about how uh, these trillion dollar industries are completely transforming themselves uh, because of change in consumer behavior. And I think what is interesting here is as the cloud infrastructure provides the elastic capability uh, to be able to improve uh, compute and storage and networking uh, on demand, uh, the industries that are leveraging the cloud are really using uh, data and AI uh, to know their customers better, to understand uh, how do they serve their customers better and to mine the data generated internally inside the industry uh, to really uh, improve their top line and improve their bottom line. And in fact, companies were not really focused on mining data and AI uh, are not doing so well today. And I think that's a real fundamental change that's happened. And if you think about all these industries, uh, that's uh, oil and gas, automotive industry, and uh, many of these industries are what we call you know, uh, atoms, right? So they're, they're, they're basically the physical world made of atoms. Uh, but what has happened in a very profound way is that the combination of atoms and bits is really where the value is being created. And companies uh, that are atom-oriented, uh, you know, they are really thinking about bits, which is data, and how to combine the atoms with the bits. And they are the ones who are able to be uh, quite agile and versatile in being able to figure out a way to transform themselves. Uh, now, uh, several of you guys know that uh, many of the changes that you've experienced, which is digital consumption of uh, movies, for example, on Netflix, or uh, being able to uh, use Uber or Airbnb, these trends have been happening quite a bit over the last uh, 10 years. But what is interesting today uh, is that uh, these transformations is really possible because of mobile phones, of course, uh, Samsung's been a big uh, part of that, uh, and also data and AI, and more importantly, the cloud. The combination of these things is really, really what has made the transformation in the last 10 years. But with COVID-19, there has been a step function in terms of how fast these digital transformation uh, has happened. And, and it's particularly in, in areas like healthcare and finance, uh, where there just isn't any other way to consume uh, these services today uh, when we are sheltered in place. And that's really given a short in the arm on, on most of these uh, digital services. Uh, we think that uh, over the next 10 years, uh, this trend will continue. Uh, and, and you're going to see industries like healthcare uh, and finance and, and the traditional uh, industry, uh, 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 the manufacturing industry, the supply chain industry that have been slow to adopt such data-based uh, digital technologies onto their uh, value chain 
is just dramatically doing that right now. So if you're an entrepreneur, uh, to leverage this trend uh, is really important because I think it's easier to get your financing done. It's easier to get your uh, customers uh, aligned and, and, and on board and paying for you uh, if you're really uh, uh, writing these waves of change, changes that's happening uh, right around us. A little bit of venture capital. Uh, uh, where, uh, how has venture capital industry changed because of consumer behavior and change of the macro situation around us? Uh, somewhat sobering. Uh, I think uh, many venture capitalists uh, have really uh, cut back on the number of investments they're doing, the velocity of investments, as well as the dollars. Uh, mostly because they're focused on their existing portfolio. They're trying to look at their companies and, and, and thinking about how to make them survive the COVID-19 situation, uh, which has really given them less amount of time to focus on new investments. And, and this is true across the board. It's true in the US, it's true in the U EU, uh, it's also true in Asia. So now, uh, uh, as you think about venture capitalists cutting back uh, on, on their investments, you as entrepreneurs will really have to think about, you know, how do you stand out? You know, how do you really stand out among your peers? How do you really think about the areas where they are investing uh, so you can really tailor what you're doing uh, to help uh, them uh, understand your story better and to really uh, take you more seriously uh, while they're really distracted today? And as venture capitalists have cut back, so have corporate venture capital. In fact, uh, in, I would argue that in, in some corporate venture capital, uh, uh, teams, uh, they've had to cut back a little bit more than traditional venture capital, as you know, traditional venture capital typically have fund lifetimes uh, and committed capital. So they're not really, uh, they, don't, they don't lose their budget, if you will, because of the crisis that we are in. But some corporate venture capital uh, uh, teams have had to cut back pretty dramatically, uh, mostly because they're still funded by the company's uh, P&L. Uh, now, a little bit about Samson Catalyst Fund. We've continued to invest uh, through the time uh, that we are in today. Uh, we're certainly spending a lot of time uh, helping our portfolio companies and really helping them navigate uh, the next one or two years uh, in the pandemic uh, situation. But we've also continued to invest in areas that really matter. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, what are the areas where we think that are still very strong uh, tailwinds uh, where we think great companies are going to be formed and and that's an important thing to think about because history will show you that every time there is a massive downturn uh, that is exactly the time when great companies are founded uh, you can go back and think about the 0708 time frame uh, the airbnbs of the world the ubers of the world uh, the squares of the world they're all companies uh, that really came out of the 0708 uh, crisis and you can go back to the uh, 1999 uh, to 2002 tech bubble crisis. And many of the companies that were founded uh, through those times really are the largest tech companies today like Facebook and, and Twitter. So I think uh, we, really, we really believe as, as venture capitalists that now is a great time to invest, uh, but we're also very cautious about what are those areas that really matter today. And I think uh, the combination of mobile and cloud services and particularly the infrastructure that goes inside the cloud uh, continues to be a really important area. And Samsung, for us, uh, uh, doing deep tech investments is bread and butter. And, and we really think about uh, in that area as a very strong area. Uh, we also think about how biology and technology is coming together in ways like never before. Uh, now, this is a really important concept to think about. I think for many, many years, in fact, decades, uh, uh, folks who invested in, in biology or life sciences uh, 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 were never really interacted with the venture capitalists who invested in technology. That's no longer true. Uh, we think that these two worlds have really come together in pretty dramatic ways. And telehealth is a perfect example. It used to be that most physicians uh, and, and, and healthcare services would use fax machines and, and, and pagers here in the U.S. But, uh, but now they are really adopting uh, uh, telehealth in a massive way. And I think it's really true about other healthcare services as well. So I think uh, the idea of, of tech helping uh, acceleration of vaccine development, uh, particularly AI and things like that, is really important over the next several years. 
Uh, we also think that safety and security is fundamentally important. Uh, we think that uh, particularly in times of pandemic and, and the generation that's growing up today, they're gonna have a very different mindset uh, about financial security, about biological security. How do they protect themselves against future pandemic, against mental health, uh, and also cybersecurity. So I think there is a very holistic way to think about how consumers are gonna think about safety and security over the next decade, uh, well beyond the pandemic. And I think these are the three big waves that Samsung Catalyst Fund uh, really believes in and have made a lot of investments over the past and we're continuing to make new investments in this area. And, and I'll point out, uh, particularly in the biology and tech space, uh, both Ada Health and Geno Medical are companies that we've actually invested in uh, just in the last couple of months. And, and both of them are really leveraging the tech infrastructure to, to better deliver uh, healthcare uh, uh, to both uh, healthcare uh, traditional industry as well as consumers and patients like us uh, directly. And I think uh, that's a really powerful thing uh, that's happening around us. Uh, one other uh, thing I'd like to talk about uh, is the cloud and, uh, and, uh, and the infrastructure area and how it really uh, fundamentally affects uh, the world that we live in. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, for Samsung, uh, deep tech infrastructure, particularly the infrastructure that goes inside the cloud, uh, is fundamentally important. Uh, we think that uh, uh, companies that are not adopting the cloud and not using what the cloud offers them and the data and AI capability that they're able to harness from it uh, will likely perish. Uh, so they really have to uh, transform themselves to be here. And I think uh, 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 the infrastructure technologies uh, that have really uh, transformed the way uh, consumers are able to get these services uh, are fundamentally important. These are the picks and shovels, if you think about the, the gold rush analogy that's really needed uh, to make uh, to make the infrastructure work the way uh, they should, and that's uh, whether it's compute or storage networking or interconnectivity or even quantum computing. These are the areas that Samsung Catalyst Fund has continued to spend a lot of time on. But we also think about the multi-trillion-dollar industries uh, where things really matter: enterprises transforming themselves, uh, how. Uh, uh, the entire value chain from manufacturing all the way to retail, robotics uh, and, and computer vision technologies being used in robotics uh, uh, in manufacturing and how uh, healthcare services are getting delivered. So we think about all of these areas as very, very important uh, uh, in order to uh, find new opportunities for Samsung. So I know uh, we've taken up uh, a bunch of time talking through these areas. Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe very quickly uh, give you a little bit of sense of how we as a team in Samsung Catalyst Fund uh, really work, and then perhaps we can open it up for questions. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we are a $500 million evergreen fund. Uh, I sit here in, in Menlo Park, uh, California, but we are a global team and we work with, uh, we work as one global team. We have offices in New York, uh, Paris, Berlin, uh, Tel Aviv, and Seoul. Uh, we really think about three things that matters to us. Uh, number one, we think about the company and whether the company can uh, really uh, win uh, even without us. The company has fundamental value, a great team, and they're going after an opportunity that matters. Uh, that's the first thing we think about. The second thing we think about is uh, from a Samsung perspective, uh, what is the one plus one equals three? Uh, and that is really fundamental, which is Crow Prosperity. We would like to see you win, and we'd like to see that Samsung really is able to help you win, and we can benefit from it. And the third thing we think about is the point behind Extreme Tech Challenge, uh, Tech for Good. Uh, are you helping to make the world a better place? Uh, Samsung, at the, at the core, is a, is a consumer company. Uh, we really think about uh, how, how can we help to make the world a better place? And, are, and you as a startup, are you, are you playing a significant part on that? And if we can answer those three questions, uh, you know, we are able to really get behind the company, make that investment and help them succeed. So with that, Barrett. Great, thank you so much, Shankar. I think we have time to take one quick question. Joseph Daniels, would you like to jump in here? Hey, uh, sorry guys, I've been on a really mad 14 hour day today. No, I just, um, 
I just wanted to evaluate, you know, uh, I'm CEO and founder of Project Utopia. We build um, the greenest buildings in the world by combining energy construction and IoT uh, through selective patents into, into building methodologies. And recently, um, as yesterday, we actually done it in a global innovation partnership with Samsung. But the key for me is, is understanding that these transformative digital industries that, that are being accelerated by COVID, is this now the opportunity considering that we're seeing um, global markets really be affected um, because of the industries of construction, because of commodities um, and, and these legacy kind of hard asset industries be affected. Are we going to now see for the first time an acceleration in these old historic asset based industries co align with digital technological innovation rather rather than these simplistic new um, kind of nuances? Is it really going to be the first time that we see an alignment on those? That's, that's kind of, that's kind of my question in summary. Uh, can I, can you, can you, uh, can you state the question again? Uh, I do agree yeah. with the trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more a line of, uh, you know, obviously we mentioned the Airbnb about hotel, retail, hospitality, these kinds of sectors that saw the early cloud adoption. They were very easy to, to bring consumers to the clients. Whereas we have a lot of these legacy industries that are around commodities, hardware, um, you know, energy and construction. Do you think that people in these older legacy industries, now that they are being forced to work more digitally, do you see there being an uptake of cloud-based technologies really taking over these older legacy industries? No, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we talked about a handful of industries and I think some will probably lag behind the others, but what is, what COVID-19 has really done, I think, is a step function difference uh, in terms of uh, the adoption rates. Uh, I think there were several uh, digital services that have been available for uh, quite a bit of time. And I think, uh, particularly perhaps the industry that you live in, uh, the concept of having uh, the IoT technologies being incorporated into construction and smart buildings and smart homes and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. None of these technologies are new and the cloud is not new as well. Uh, yeah. But in the situation that we are in today, uh, particularly when uh, you know, uh, there are certain physical activities that are practically impossible and perhaps unsafe, it's really mm -hmm. leading to a fundamental difference in the way one might think about smart technologies getting adopted. For example, how do you really uh, you know, get, uh, get uh, you know, uh, things delivered to your doorstep uh, that is safe and and doesn't put you in peril, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you how do you ensure security of assets? Uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, uh, some of the things that you might own that you never are able to go physically uh, see anymore, right? Yeah. So there are many many things that are that are practically impossible without leveraging the cloud and without using sensors and the data that comes from the sensors and to then think about the services uh, that can be adopted we absolutely see a step function difference. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the investments that we've made you know, in robotics, for example, uh, one of our companies uh, basically uh, builds a robot that scans uh, the aisles of Walmart. It's a company called Bossa Nova. Uh, what mm -hmm. they basically do is ensure that uh, the shelves uh, don't stock out because so you, have, you have very little visibility on, on, on what's on the shelf uh, particularly yeah. in a large superstore. So that gives you a sense of how data uh, is getting utilized in industries and in ways that it's practically humanly impossible uh, to do, but really uh, helping transform and bringing digital, uh, uh, digital technologies very close to the atoms, right? And that's really the transformation we see across the board. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Shankar. Um, thank you, Joseph, for the question. And thank you, Shankar, for um, all, helping all of us, helping the founders better understand all these rapid changes going on around us and how investors are thinking in this post-COVID area. I think it'll be extremely helpful for many of the founders as they navigate their startup in this, these extraordinary times. So I think that's all the time we have for that session. Thank you again, Shankar. Actually, Shankar, one last question. If the startups in the room would like to get in contact with you, how, how should they go about doing that? Um, Super easy. Uh, send me a LinkedIn connection. I'll be happy to respond back to you. Uh, you can also send me an email, uh, which is shankar.c at samsung.com. Great. Thank you so much, Shankar.